This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anti-Federalist Papers, Anti-Federalist No. 19. Letters from the Federal Farmer to the Republican, Letter No. 17. January 23, 1788. Dear Sir, I believe the people of the United States are full in the opinion that a free and mild government can be preserved in their extensive territories only under the substantial forms of a federal republic. As several of the ablest advocates for the system proposed have acknowledged this, and I hope the confessions they have published will be preserved and remembered, I shall not take up time to establish this point. A question then arises how far that system partakes of a federal republic. I observed in a former letter that it appears to be the first important step to a consolidation of the states, that its strong tendency is to that point. But what do we mean by a federal republic, and what by a consolidated government? To erect a federal republic we must first make a number of states on republican principles, each state with a government organized for the internal management of its affairs. The states, as such, must unite under a federal head and delegate to it powers to make and execute laws in certain enumerated cases under certain restrictions. This head may be a single assembly like the present Congress, or the Amphictionate Council, or it may consist of a legislature with one or more branches of an executive and of a judiciary. To form a consolidated or one entire government, there must be no state or local governments, but all things, persons, and property must be subject to the laws of one legislature alone, to one executive and one judiciary. Each state government, as the government of New Jersey, etc., is a consolidated or one entire government, as it respects the counties, towns, citizens, and property within the limits of the state. The state governments are the basis, the pillar on which the federal head is placed, and the whole together, when formed on elective principles, constitute a federal republic. A federal republic in itself supposes state or local governments to exist as the body or props on which the federal head rests, and that it cannot remain a moment after they cease. In erecting the federal government, and always in its councils, each state must be known as a sovereign body. But in erecting this government, I conceive, the legislature of the state, by the expressed or implied assent of the people, or the people of the state, under the direction of the government of it, may accede to the federal compact. Nor do I conceive it to be necessarily a part of a confederacy of states, that each have an equal voice in the general councils. A confederated republic being organized, each state must retain powers for managing its internal police, and all delegate to the Union power to manage general concerns. The quantity of power the Union must possess is one thing. The mode of exercising the powers given is quite a different consideration and it is the mode of exercising them that makes one of the essential distinctions between one entire or consolidated government and a federal republic. That is, however the government may be organized, if the laws of the Union in most important concerns, as in levying and collecting taxes, raising troops, etc., operate immediately upon the persons and property of individuals and not on states, extend to organizing the militia, etc., the government, as to its administration, as to making and executing laws, is not federal but consolidated. To illustrate my idea, the Union makes a requisition and assigns to each state its quota of men or monies wanted. Each state, by its own laws and officers, in its own way, furnishes its quota. Here the state governments stand between the Union and individuals. The laws of the Union operate only on states, as such, and federally. Here nothing can be done without the meetings of the state legislatures, but in the other case the Union, though the state legislatures should not meet for years together, proceeds immediately by its own laws and officers to levy and collect monies of individuals, to enlist men, form armies, etc. Here the laws of the Union operate immediately on the body of the people, on persons and property, in the same manner the laws of one entire consolidated government operate. These two modes are very distinct, and in their operation and consequences have directly opposite tendencies. The first makes the existence of the state governments indispensable, and throws all the detailed business of levying and collecting taxes, etc., into the hands of those governments, and into the hands, of course, of many thousand officers, 
solely created by and dependent on the state. The last entirely excludes the agency of the respective states, and throws the whole business of levying and collecting taxes, etc., into the hands of many thousand officers solely created by and dependent upon the Union, and makes the existence of the state government of no consequence in the case. It is true, Congress, in raising any given sum in direct taxes, must, by the Constitution, raise so much of it in one state, and so much in another, by a fixed rule, which most of the states some time since agreed to. But this does not affect the principle in question. It only secures each state against any arbitrary proportions. The federal mode is perfectly safe and eligible. Founded in the true spirit of a confederated republic, there could be no possible exception to it. Did we not find by experience that the states will sometimes neglect to comply with the reasonable requisitions of the Union, it being according to the fundamental principles of federal republics to raise men and monies by requisitions, and for the states individually to organize and train the militia, I conceive there can be no reason whatever for departing from them, except this, that the states sometimes neglect to comply with reasonable requisitions, and that it is dangerous to attempt to compel a delinquent state by force, as it may often produce a war. We ought, therefore, to inquire attentively how extensive the evils to be guarded against are, and cautiously limit the remedies to the extent of the evils. I am not about to defend the Confederation, or to charge the proposed Constitution with imperfections not in it. But we ought to examine facts, and strip them of the false colorings often given them by incautious observers, by unthinking or designing men. We ought to premise that laws for raising men and monies, even in consolidated governments, are not often punctually complied with. Historians, except in extraordinary cases, but very seldom take notice of the detailed collection of taxes. But these facts we have fully proved, and well attested, that the most energetic governments have relinquished taxes frequently, which were of many years standing. These facts amply prove that taxes assessed have remained many years uncollected. I agree there have been instances in the republics of Greece, Holland, etc., in the course of several centuries, of states neglecting to pay their quotas of requisitions. But it is a circumstance certainly deserving of attention, whether these nations which have depended on requisitions principally for their defense, have not raised men and monies nearly as punctually as entire governments, which have taxed directly, whether we have not found the latter as often distressed for the want of troops and monies as the former. It has been said that the Amphictionate Council and the Germanic Head have not possessed sufficient powers to control the members of the Republic in a proper manner. Is this, if true, to be imputed to requisitions? Is it not principally to be imputed to the unequal powers of those members, connected with this important circumstance, that each member possessed power to league itself with foreign powers, and powerful neighbors, without the consent of the Head? After all, has not the Germanic body a government as good as its neighbors in general? And did not the Grecian Republic remain united several centuries, and form the theater of human greatness? No government in Europe has commanded monies more plentifully than the government of Holland. As to the United States, the separate states lay taxes directly, and the Union calls for taxes by way of requisitions. And is it a fact that more monies are due in proportion on requisitions in the United States than on the state taxes directly laid? It is but about ten years since Congress begun to make requisitions, and in that time the monies, etc., required, and the bounties given for men required of the states, have amounted, specie value, to about thirty-six millions dollars, about twenty-four millions of dollars of which have been actually paid and a very considerable part of the twelve millions not paid, remains so not so much from the neglect of the states, as from the sudden changes in paper money, etc., which in a great measure rendered payments of no service, and which often induced the Union indirectly to relinquish one demand, by making another in a different form. Before we totally condemn requisitions, we ought to consider what immense bounties the states gave, and what prodigious exertions they made in the war, in order to comply with the requisitions of Congress. And if, since the peace, they have been delinquent, ought we not carefully to inquire whether that delinquency is to be imputed solely to the nature of requisitions? Ought it not in part to be imputed to two other causes, 
I mean first an opinion that has extensively prevailed, that the requisitions for domestic interest have not been founded on just principles, and secondly the circumstance that the government itself, by proposing imposts, etc., has departed virtually from the constitutional system, which proposed changes, like all changes proposed in government, produce an inattention and negligence in the execution of the government in being. I am not for depending wholly on requisitions, but I mention these few facts to show they are not so totally futile as many pretend. For the truth of many of these facts I appeal to the public records, and for the truth of the others I appeal to many Republican characters who are best informed in the affairs of the United States. Since the peace, until the convention reported, the wisest men in the United States generally supposed that certain limited funds would answer the purposes of the Union. And though the states are by no means in so good a condition as I wish they were, yet I think I may very safely affirm they are in a better condition than they would be had Congress always possessed the powers of taxation now contended for. The fact is admitted that our federal government does not possess sufficient powers to give life and vigor to the political system, and that we experience disappointments and several inconveniences, but we ought carefully to distinguish those which are merely the consequences of a severe and tedious war from those which arise from defects in the federal system. There has been an entire revolution in the United States within thirteen years, and the least we can compute the waste of labor and property at during that period by the war is three hundred million of dollars. Our people are like a man just recovering from a severe fit of sickness. It was the war that disturbed the course of commerce, introduced floods of paper money, the stagnation of credit, and threw many valuable men out of steady business. From these sources our greatest evils arise. Men of knowledge and reflection must perceive it. But then, have we not done more in three or four years past in repairing the injuries of the war by repairing houses and estates, restoring industry, frugality, the fisheries, manufactures, etc., and thereby laying the foundation of good government, and of individual and political happiness, than any people ever did in a like time? We must judge from a view of the country and the facts, and not from foreign newspapers or our own, which are printed chiefly in the commercial towns, where imprudent living, imprudent importations, and many unexpected disappointments have produced a despondency, and a disposition to view everything on the dark side. Some of the evils we feel, all will agree, ought to be imputed to the defective administration of the governments. From these and various considerations, I am very clearly of opinion that the evils we sustain merely on account of the defects of the Confederation are but as a feather in the balance against a mountain, compared with those which would infallibly be the result of the loss of general liberty, and that happiness men enjoy under a frugal, free, and mild government. Heretofore we do not seem to have seen danger anywhere, but in giving power to Congress, and now nowhere but in Congress wanting powers, and without examining the extent of the evils to be remedied by one step, we are for giving up to Congress almost all powers of any importance without limitation. The defects of the Confederation are extravagantly magnified, and every species of pain we feel imputed to them, and hence it is inferred there must be a total change of the principles, as well as forms of government, and in the main point touching the Federal powers we rest all on a logical inference, totally inconsistent with experience and sound political reasoning. It is said that as the federal head must make peace and war, and provide for the common defense, it ought to possess all powers necessary to that end, that powers unlimited as to the person sword to raise men and monies and form the militia are necessary to that end, and therefore the federal head ought to possess them. This reasoning is far more specious than solid. It is necessary that these powers so exist in the body politic as to be called into exercise whenever necessary for the public safety. But it is by no means true that the man or congress of men whose duty it more immediately is to provide for the common defense ought to possess them without limitation. But clear it is that if such men or congress be not in a situation to hold them without danger to liberty, he or they ought not to possess them. 
It has long been thought to be a well-founded position that the purse and sword ought not to be placed in the same hands in a free government. Our wise ancestors have carefully separated them, placed the sword in the hands of their king, even under considerable limitations, and the purse in the hands of the commons alone. Yet the king makes peace and war, and it is his duty to provide for the common defense of the nation. The authority at least goes thus far, that a nation well versed in the science of government does not conceive it to be necessary or expedient for the man entrusted with a common defense, and general tranquillity, to possess unlimitedly the powers in question, or even in any considerable degree. Could he whose duty it is to defend the public possess in himself independently all the means of doing it consistent with the public good, it might be convenient but the people of England know that their liberties and happiness would be in infinitely greater danger from the king's unlimited possession of these powers than from all external enemies and internal commotions to which they might be exposed. Therefore, though they have made it his duty to guard the empire, yet they have wisely placed in other hands, the hands of the representatives, the power to deal out and control the means. In Holland their high mightiness must provide for the common defense but for the means they depend in a considerable degree upon the requisitions made on the state or local assemblies. Reason and facts evince that however convenient it might be for an executive magistrate or federal head more immediately charged with the national defense and safety, solely, directly, and independently to possess all the means, yet such magistrate or head never ought to possess them, if thereby the public liberties shall be endangered. The powers in question never have been, by nations wise and free, deposited, nor can they ever be with safety anywhere but in the principal members of the national system. Where these form one entire government, as in Great Britain, they are separated and lodged in the principal members of it. But in a federal republic there is quite a different organization. The people form this kind of government generally, because their territories are too extensive to admit of their assembling in one legislature or of executing the laws on free principles under one entire government. They convene in their local assemblies for local purposes, and for managing their internal concerns, and unite their states under a federal head for general purposes. It is the essential characteristic of a confederated republic that this head be dependent on and kept within limited bounds by the local governments, and it is because in these alone, in fact, the people can be substantially assembled or represented. It is therefore we universally see, in this kind of government, the congressional powers placed in a few hands, and accordingly limited and specifically enumerated, and the local assemblies strong and well guarded, and composed of numerous members. Wise men will always place the controlling power where the people are substantially collected by their representatives. By the proposed system, the federal head will possess, without limitation, almost every species of power that can, in its exercise tend to change the government, or to endanger liberty, while in it, I think, it has been fully shown, the people will have but the shadow of representation, and but the shadow of security for their rights and liberties. In a confederated republic, the division of representation in its nature requires a correspondent division and deposit of powers, relative to taxes and military concerns and I think the plan offered stands quite alone in confounding the principles of governments in themselves totally distinct. I wish not to exculpate the states for their improper neglects in not paying their quotas of requisitions, but in applying the remedy we must be governed by reason and facts. It will not be denied that the people have a right to change the government when the majority choose it, if not restrained by some existing compact that they have a right to displace their rulers, and consequently to determine when their measures are reasonable or not, and that they have a right at any time to put a stop to those measures they may deem prejudicial to them, by such forms and negatives as they may see fit to provide. From all these, and many other well-founded considerations, I need not mention, a question arises, what powers shall there be delegated to the federal head, to ensure safety as well as energy in the government? I think there is a safe and proper medium pointed out by experience, by reason, and facts. When we have organized the government, we ought to give power to the Union, so far only as experience and present circumstances shall direct, with a reasonable regard to time to come. 
should future circumstances contrary to our expectations require that further powers be transferred to the union we can do it far more easily than get back those we may now imprudently give the system proposed is untried candid advocates and opposers admit that it is in a degree a mere experiment and that its organization is weak and imperfect surely then the safe ground is cautiously to vest power in it and when we are sure we have given enough for ordinary exigencies be extremely careful how we delegate powers which in common cases must necessarily be useless or abused and of very uncertain effects in uncommon ones by giving the union power to regulate commerce and to levy and collect taxes by imposts we give it an extensive authority and permanent productive funds i believe quite as adequate to the present demands of the union as excises and direct taxes can be made to the present demands of the separate states the state governments are now about four times as expensive as that of the union and their several state debts added together are nearly as large as that of the union our impost duties since the peace have been almost as productive as the other sources of taxation and when under one general system of regulations the probability is that those duties will be very considerably increased indeed the representation proposed will hardly justify giving to congress unlimited powers to raise taxes by imposts in addition to the other powers the union must necessarily have it is said that if congress possess only authority to raise taxes by imposts trade probably will be overburdened with taxes and the taxes of the union be found inadequate to any uncommon exigencies to this we may observe that trade generally finds its own level and will naturally and necessarily heave off any undue burdens laid upon it further if congress alone possess the impost and also unlimited power to raise monies by excises and direct taxes there must be much more danger that two taxing powers the union and states will carry excises and direct taxes to an unreasonable extent especially as these have not the natural boundaries taxes on trade have however it is not my object to propose to exclude congress from raising monies by internal taxes as by duties excises and direct taxes but my opinion is that congress especially in its proposed organization ought not to raise monies by internal taxes except in strict conformity to the federal plan that is by the agency of the state governments in all cases except where a state shall neglect for an unreasonable time to pay its quota of a requisition and never where so many of the state legislatures as represent a majority of the people shall formally determine an excise law or requisition is improper in their next session after the same be laid before them we ought always to recollect that the evil to be guarded against is found by our own experience and the experience of others to be mere neglect in the states to pay their quotas and power in the union to levy and collect the neglecting states quotas with interest is fully adequate to the evil by this federal plan with this exception mentioned we secure the means of collecting taxes by the usual process of law and avoid the evil of attempting to compel or coerce a state and we also avoid a circumstance which never yet could be and i am fully confident never can be admitted in a free federal republic i mean a permanent and continued system of tax laws of the union executed in the bowels of the states by many thousand officers dependent as to the assessing and collecting federal taxes solely upon the union on every principle then we ought to provide that the union render an exact account of all monies raised by impost and other taxes and that whenever money shall be wanted for the purposes of the union beyond the proceeds of the impost duties requisitions shall be made on the states for the monies so wanted and that the power of laying and collecting shall never be exercised except in cases where a state shall neglect a given time to pay its quota this mode seems to be strongly pointed out by the reason of the case and the spirit of the government and i believe there is no instance to be found in a federal republic where the congressional powers ever extended generally to collecting monies by direct taxes or excises creating all these restrictions still in the powers of the union in matters of taxation will be too unlimited further checks in my mind are indispensably necessary nor do i conceive that as full a representation is as practicable in the federal government will afford sufficient security 
the strength of the government and the confidence of the people must be collected principally in the local assemblies every part or branch of the federal head must be feeble and unsafely trusted with large powers a government possessed of more power than its constituent parts will justify will not only probably abuse it but be unequal to bear its own burden it may as soon be destroyed by the pressure of power as languish and perish for want of it there are two ways of raising checks and guarding against undue combinations and influence in a federal system the first is in levying taxes raising and keeping up armies in building navies in forming plans for the militia and in appropriating monies for the support of the military to require the attendance of a large proportion of the federal representatives as two-thirds or three-fourths of them and in passing laws in these important cases to require the consent of two-thirds or three-fourths of the members present the second is by requiring that certain important laws of the federal head as a requisition or law for raising monies by excise shall be laid before the state legislatures and if disapproved of by a given number of them say by as many of them as represent a majority of the people the law shall have no effect whether it would be advisable to adopt both or either of these checks i will not undertake to determine we have seen them both exist in confederated republics the first exists substantially in the confederation and will exist in some measure in the plan proposed as in choosing a president by the house in expelling members in the senate in making treaties and in deciding on impeachments and in the whole in altering the constitution the last exists in the united netherlands but in a much greater extent the first is founded on this principle that these important measures may sometimes be adopted by a bare quorum of members perhaps from a few states and that a bare majority of the federal representatives may frequently be of the aristocracy or some particular interests connections or parties in the community and governed by motives views and inclinations not compatible with the general interest the last is founded on this principle that the people will be substantially represented only in their state or local assemblies that their principal security must be found in them and that therefore they ought to have ultimately a constitutional control over such interesting measures i have often heard it observed that our people are well informed and will not submit to oppressive governments that the state governments will be their ready advocates and possess their confidence mix with them and enter into all their wants and feelings this is true but of what avail will these circumstances be if the state governments thus allowed to be the guardians of the people possess no kind of power by the forms of the social compact to stop in their passage the laws of congress injurious to the people state governments must stand and see the law take place they may complain and petition so may individuals the members of them in extreme cases may resist on the principles of self-defense so may the people and individuals it has been observed that the people in extensive territories have more power compared with that of their rulers than in small states is not directly the opposite true the people in a small state can unite and act in concert and with vigor but in large territories the men who govern find it more easy to unite while the people cannot while they cannot collect the opinions of each part while they move to different points and one part is often played off against the other it has been asserted that the confederate head of a republic at best is in general weak and dependent that the people will attach themselves to and support their local governments in all disputes with the union admit the fact is it any way to remove the inconvenience by accumulating powers upon a weak organization the fact is that the detailed administration of affairs in this mixed republic depends principally on the local governments and the people would be wretched without them and a great proportion of social happiness depends on the internal administration of justice and on internal police the splendor of the monarch and the power of the government are one thing the happiness of the subject depends on very different causes but it is to the latter that the best men the greatest ornaments of human nature have most carefully attended it is to the former tyrants and oppressors have always aimed yours the federal farmer end of anti-federalist number nineteen